Kala, respected director Dr. Manoj Kumar Tiwari sir, dean student affairs Dr. Hema Rathe ma'am, honorable faculty members, officers and staff of NITI and student participants. It is with much pride and elation that I welcome you all to the first curtain raiser event of Harvard in 2021, Prerna Business Meet. It is a flagship leadership talk of series of Avatan where industry leaders share lessons and experiences from their life to prepare management students for their future. The theme of today's session is creating a culture of innovation with our distinguished guest, Mr. Harsh Mariwala, founder and chairman of Mariko, a Fortune India 500 company. In 1990, he founded Mariko, a fast-moving consumer goods manufacturer and distributor that now has operations in 25 countries across Asia and Africa. Over the last three decades, he has transformed a traditional commodity-driven business into a leading consumer products company in the beauty and wellness space. He is also the founder of Kaya Limited, which runs a chain of, skin, chain of skincare clinics across India and Middle East. SN Foundation, a peer learning entrepreneurial platform. Mariko Innovation Foundation that works towards nurturing innovations in India and Mariwala Health Initiative that supports mental health causes. As of 2021, Mr. Mariwala has been ranked by Forbes as the 55th wealthiest and influential Indian. The National Institute of Industrial Engineering was established in the year 1963 by the Government of India and United Nations Indust International Labour Organization. It was named the Center of Excellence in Logistics and Supply Chain Management in September of 2021. The endeavor was to create an institute that would generate solutions to the problems of an aggressively expanding industrial order and to upskill the next generation of techno managers. I would now request Dean Student Affairs, Dr. Hema Date Ma'am, to welcome our guest. Thank you. Uh, very good morning to all of you. Respected Director Sir, Harsh Mariola Sir, Founder and Chairman of Marico, Deans, Faculty Colleagues, and my dear students. I am pleased to welcome you all to the Curtain Resin event of Avartan 2021, Niti Mumbai. It's a matter of great pleasure for all of us to welcome Mr. Harsh Mariwala, Founder and Chairman, Mariko, for the Curtain Resin event of Avartan 2021. Sir's passion for innovation enthused him to establish the Mariko Innovation Foundation in 2003, which works towards nurturing innovation in India. As an expression of his personal social responsibility in 2012, he launched a Sin Foundation, accelerating the scaling up of enterprises, a pure learning entrepreneurial platform. He also founded the Mariwala Health Initiatives, MHI, in 2015, with the philanthropic aim of giving back to the society. We are all very excited to have you here with us, sir, at NITI Mumbai. Also, we are eager to learn from your experiences and wisdom. Without further ado, I welcome the faculty moderator for today, uh, Professor Poonam Singh to take forward the session. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. A very warm welcome to Mr. Harsh Mariwala on behalf of NITI. Uh, of course, uh, you know, a few years back when you were in NITI uh, in our Laksh Awards and I was sitting in the audience and mesmerizingly listening to you, I didn't know that I would have this privilege in a few years time to share this virtual dais with you. Uh, it would have been obviously lovely if you if we could have had you in the, the physical form as before. But nevertheless, given this pandemic, this is the best we can do. Uh, of course, uh, it doesn't uh, require saying that the kind of impact that you have for our students and uh, the continuous patronage that you have been giving to Niti is something we are really privileged to have. And thank you so much for doing this again for us. Uh, along with that, your book, Hush Realities, I, I would like to call it Hush Realities only, that has been really having, uh, you know, the kind of impact uh, that the new generation should be learning from uh, with your vast experience, 
leadership and uh, the innovations that you have introduced. So without much ado, I would hand over the uh, virtual dice to you and not be a hindrance between you and our listeners. Thank you very much. Over thank you. Sir. Good morning to all of you. Thank you, Poonam. Thank you, Professor Date. And thank you, Anu, for all the kind words uh, you've spoken about me. I want to begin by saying that I'm just a commerce graduate. Unlike most of you who've done postgraduate, I'm just a commerce graduate from Bombay University. And at a very young age, I joined the family organization. I was not that bright to be selected for an MBA program. In India, that time, the number of programs were limited. There were only IIM, Ahmedabad, Calcutta, and I think Bajaj School of Management. And my father said, no, you can't go abroad for studies. So I joined the family organization at the age of 20. And it was a, uh, it was completely family managed. My father being the eldest and three of his brothers were managing a business uh, in edible oils, bulk, in, uh, in spice extracts and in chemicals, unrelated businesses. But uh, it was, everything was managed by the family in the sense that there were no professionals. There were family relatives, family acquaintances who were helping the family, but uh, all the decisions were taken by the family. And I was let loose uh, by my father that, okay, you start exploring whatever you want to do in life, uh, whatever part of the business you like doing, wherever you want to add value. So my exploration journey began by visiting all the factories, businesses, customers, and it may have happened for a year or so. And at that time, I realized that the organization needed to do much more uh, and get converted from so-called family managed to a professionally managed company. And um, the edible oil business was not being managed well. It was uh, subject to a lot of fluctuation in terms of raw material prices. We were supplying it mainly to the paint industry, biscuit industry. So mainly the turnover came from bulk. And I realized that if I can convert that business from unbranded to branded, then to that extent, it will give me a huge opportunity to... to uh, Recording in progress. So that will give a great opportunity for me to learn and more importantly, to create a business which is sustainable and profitable. And since then, my journey began by traveling to interior markets, appointing distributors, staying with distributors where there were no hotels. So I actually started doing things at a very, shall I say, at a very uh, basic level in terms of uh, whatever work I had to do. And I think that that really prepared me in terms of understanding how the business operates. So if I had studied abroad and done MBA or something, then I would have thought that I know it all. And that happens to many MBAs, I've seen it. Then I would have been frustrated. You know, I would have had a superficial kind of look at the things, thinking that I, I'm, I'm master of everything. But the fact that I got that grounding in terms of appointing distributors, going to the trade, selling products, uh, appointing an ad agency and spending one week with them and asking them to teach me advertising. And also interacted a lot with uh, individual consultants who uh, were helping me because there was a lack of domain knowledge in terms of each function. And I was not, the fact that I had just studied commerce, nobody had taught me anything about marketing or distribution or HR or finance. So virtually for each and every function, I had a functional, I had identified an individual whom I knew or I, I contacted and you know, knew through some network and was learning from them in, in the evenings. I worked with a professor from IIM and Dabad uh, in the area of marketing, somebody else in the area of HR and started setting up systems for professionalizing the organization. And I think that really helped me because, you know, I started on a very small base. I started recruiting talent. So I built the whole organization from virtually from bottom up, zero base to, to a far more professionally. And then, you know, if I look back at my own journey, if I, we, we started distributing, we got some success in terms of creating a brand awareness for the brand parachutes of Ola. But if I look back at my journey, and identify critical points where it has made a big impact on the business. I would say innovation has played the most important role. Uh, it's a very, very competitive business environment. And if any of you want to enter a new business, you can't offer something which is me too. You have to be different because the customer, why should they buy it from you? If you're offering the same product, uh, if you, you can do it at a lower price, but that low price, uh, option will not help you sustain over a long period of time. So you need 
to identify something which is very very unique for you to succeed and uh, ideally speaking for me it was either innovation or doing something completely new which was not there in the market and i think if i look at the history of all our launches new product launches it is based on these two principles of innovation of pioneering opportunities now depending on the kind of business one is it could be different if you are in a service business it could be some service initiative or service you are giving for example in domino's pizza other services okay give delivery within a certain time frame and so that's their business model it could be in case of a pharma business it would be patent for developing a uh, developing a formulation and so on and so forth but what i'm trying to say is that if you want to succeed in business you have to create a strong right to win and that right to win has to go on improving every year because it is a matter of time when other players will start copying you and when they start copying you if you have a innovation engine on a perpetual basis you will all you would have already identified something more innovative by the time they come in so i think the key thing is to identify what kind of culture you require to be innovative because it has to be a perpetual engine and every person in the organization should go on thinking of innovation and not just something which is led by the top initially maybe at that time it was led by the top by me and some of my colleagues but over a period of time i think what we are trying to do in marico is to build that culture of innovation so every person can start thinking of what can i do what can i add value uh, to the organization it could happen to anybody it could happen to a workman also you know and we have seen innovations coming out of at our factory at the lowest levels i still remember many many years back about 20 25 years back we used to pack bottles on a filling line and once in a while you would get complaint from our distributors or dealers that in the carton one bottle was empty it was not filled the problem was maybe in the filling line where one bottle just got missed out so that that time there were no sensors and all that i'm talking and one workman came and said okay why don't you put a fan when the bottles are just filled. so if there's a fan if there's an empty bottle just fly off you know because there's no way in it so simple initiatives like that make a big big impact on the organization the innovation journey and if i have to quote two three innovative examples um of recent times you know we have launched a full masala works but prior to that we had we had actually launched a full of baked snacks about 5 or 7 years back and these baked snacks we were the pioneers in launching baked snacks we did that in in the bombay market under the brand name sofola uh we thought because it is under sofola it should be very healthy and there was a there was a trade off between health and taste and we felt that health is more important than taste but in a snacks category what happens especially in impulsive category like snacks people want taste first and health later it could be healthy but it has to be tasty there is no shortcut to not being tasty so we made a mistake by going overboard on health very healthy product very beneficial for health but not as good in taste and the consumer just rejected that product so with that inside we said that now okay it was a big learning for us so in because it was one of our first entries into foods and then we launched sofola sofola oats four five years later plain oats where we got some market share of 10 15 20% against the bigger players like quaker and kellogs but we were stagnating again because we didn't have anything unique in our product uh, we got distribution so that gave us some market share we had a brand name pairs of ola so that also helped but we started stagnating and then the team realized that what can we find out from the consumer about oats and in our inciting journey with the consumers we came to the conclusion that the indian uh, indians like breakfast which is a savory breakfast. and not a sweet breakfast normally plain what you make into a sweet uh, porridge and then you have it with milk but in this case can we offer something savory in masala oats so with our failure in baked snacks we said that we have to go overboard on on taste so we actually profiled the taste preferences for each state because in india being a vast country each state has a different taste profile gujarati like something sweet uh, andhra it's like like something spicy uh, somebody else will like a different flavor of pongal flavor up from from tamil nadu 
So after doing that, we had tailor-made our Safola Masala Awards depending on the taste needs. And we launched different variants in different states. And we are the pioneers. So two things which work. One was the insight that we Indians like savory breakfast. And number two, going overboard on taste and offering something which was relevant for that particular state and its population in terms of a taste, matching of the taste. And that product has done exceedingly well. That We have an 80% market share in Safola Masala Oats. We are the pioneers in that category. And because of that, our market share in the plain oats also has gone up substantially. And we are now very close number two in if you combine masala and plain oats and we'll be number one hopefully within a few months or at least within a year or so. So it's a big category. This year we intend doing a turnover at about 300, 400 crores in combined safala, plain and masala oats. But what I'm trying to say is, you know, consumer insight and combine that with innovative options plays a huge role in creating new markets. In this case, we created new market. There was a need, latent needs, which we exploited. And I think that's the key thing. Consumer, I mean, there are limitations to market research. I know that many management students, they want to do market research, get all the answers. But my viewpoint is that there is no shortcut to actually meeting consumers. And the topmost level also, one has to go on meeting individual customers because many times the customers themselves don't know what they want. So that ability to find out from the customer what are the latent needs which are not satisfied is something which is the job of top management or senior management to find out what is missing in their lives and what can I offer something which makes sense to them in terms of an opportunity. So multiple examples I can go on talking about what happened. So for a parachute as a brand, we were stagnating 10-15% market share. The whole market was intense. We saw an opportunity in plastic, huge resistance from the trade. We overcame that resistance by actually offering product which was difficult for the rats to bite. We tested all that. We executed that. The whole market today is converted from tin to plastics. We are the, and that helped us gain market share from 15% to almost 50%. And then we saw an opportunity in Bangladesh to again the whole market in tins dominated by local brands. And we said, whatever you've done in India, we could do it in Bangladesh. We went to Bangladesh over four or five years. And now we are 80% market share in Bangladesh market, going absolutely uh, within five years, without the brand being aware. There was a spillover of advertising from West Bengal to Bangladesh. But we are the largest Indian company in Bangladesh today, and doing a turnover of about 800 crores or so in that market. So it's, I think innovation is something, the ability to identify what differentiates, makes sense to the consumer, and also executing it, because it is just not innovative. Innovation doesn't happen in one mind. You have to go on dialoguing, debating, you have to go on experimenting, prototyping, and learn from those prototyping initiatives and remove the fear of failure. I think it's very important because if there is a fear of failure within the organization, people will not take risks. Innovation goes hand in hand with failures, risk taking, and removing the fear of failure. And I've seen many youngsters, they don't want to take a risk because at that stage in their career, when they have passed out from good management school or engineering school, I mean, they want to ensure that, you know, it does not impact their career, that there is no negative on their biodata. But my viewpoint is that it is okay to take a risk. You know, it's okay to fail because they say sometimes you win and sometimes you lose. And I say sometimes you win, but you always learn. You don't lose. And I have had multiple failures in my life. Multiple, I can, not one, ten, I can say, which have impacted my journey. At that time, I felt terrible. Oh my God, how could I have done anything like that? But if I look back, there has been some learning out of that failure and that learning has got incorporated in my later journey, which has been a bigger source of success. You know, So it's okay to fail. I'm not saying fail because of some shoddy kind of homework you're doing. You have to do homework. But market research has its own set of limitations. You, know, you can't do market research in each You have to be in the marketplace to know consumer expectation and you can't answer all the questions through market research. So, I mean, Similarly, Arivai was a brand which was launched pioneering. I, I was, it was my personal problem. I like starch clothes and my wife found, found that it was difficult for her to start the clothes. And then I worked with a starch manufacturer, identified a need, and then we start, started Arivai. A medical, which is a brand we acquired from Procter & Gamble Medical anti lice shampoo. And we realized that if you offered the same product in the oil format, uh, we would be able to increase sales because in rural areas, people don't use shampoo, they use oils. And we launched within one year of acquisition, 
medical anti lice oil and our sales just doubled because we went to a area where people were used to using oil and not they're not never tried shampoo so i'm trying to say that consumer inciting and differentiation is is a very much a part and parcel of your journey if you want to run a business now how do you create a culture of innovation this is a larger challenge you know so when marico was formed in the year 1990 to cover the consumer product business of bombay oil industry you know we had two brands of ola parachute and i was getting stifled in bombay oil industry because by then three four of my cousins had joined business and i was not able to attract talent from outside and to me talent played a very very important role in driving our growth journey and our on top of that our office was located in the heart of commodity markets in masjid bandar so very difficult to attract talent people would just not come you know many a time people would uh, would call them for an interview and before coming to the office only they would run away because that area is very very crowded in the transport go down area a lot of hand carts dirty no parking place so people would not want to get into an office with that kind of surrounding so i used to meet them at the willingdon club and you know give them the all the good things about the job and the company and then prepare them to eventually to come to masjid bandar but i was facing a lot of issues and i think i was able to convince the family that allow me to take this business in marico you know uh, in a different company so that's how marico was formed and i started taking uh, managers within a short period of time something like about 6 months to 1 year i must have taken 30 40 managers from different backgrounds and realized very quickly that it had become a melting pot of different cultures because each manager came with their own set of beliefs values and the way one should do business for example if there is a non performer somebody would say let's sack him somebody else would say no no we can't we have to be loyal to him somebody else would say let's train him so there was a need to identify what is the organization we are doing things what are our values and that led me write down all my values in detail and share with my team um a lot of deliberation with my team and then next two layers uh, talking to them asking them to critique the values but my key learning in all that was that when you involve people you get their commitment i could have developed the values with uh, with a consultant and you know told them this is the values please practice but then i would not have got that commitment and if you have to create a strong culture it has to be led from the top the top two or three layers of management have to send the right signals if somebody at senior level says no these are md's values or this is something which i would buy into then people down the line will find enough excuse not to practice values and i didn't want that to happen i had heard from many individuals who had joined me that you know this company is like this there's a lot of gossiping backbiting politicking i wanted to avoid all that and many people said they're okay the values are pasted at the reception but nobody really practices it is just to show others that these are the values and culture so i was very very i was absolutely determined that we have to take values seriously and we have to create convert that values into culture defining values is very easy actually but converting into culture is the difficult part and it can take anywhere between 3 to 5 years to convert that into a culture and one of the things which uh, which i had uh, sorry I'll let me just see how, okay which i had uh, i was had in mind was that we have to create a culture which is very innovative and uh, how do you create an innovative culture was a big challenge so we said that first of all we need a uh, very good talent so we we since then we started recruiting management graduates and engineering graduates from that time on onwards and we started promoting that so good talent then we said we have to convert that talent into a flat organization structure because then if you have structure which has lesser hierarchy then people will be empowered much more and there will be less bureaucracy so we went into flat structure then we said that we have to have very high degree of openness so if people should be able to talk to each other openly rather than reaching behind the backs so how do you promote openness so we said that can we have an open office we are moving into a new office then can we call each other by first name can we ensure that nobody wears t ties and suits in the organization we since then we've been having open house for all our employees which is a physical event where they are allowed to ask any questions to management so again promotes openness then we would have uh, sessions with the boss and the and the team going out for two days and talk about what i like about you what i don't like about you so again promotes openness and encourage people to give feedback and also share a lot of information so when you reinforce openness from different angles you create an open culture 
So we wanted to have an open culture because innovation doesn't happen in, in R&D setup. It has to be. Ideas can come from anywhere. And they need to be talked cross-functionally to other people because each person, each of us has blind spots. So if I have a good idea and if I talk to you, then you'll say, oh, good idea or not good idea. Why don't look at it from this angle? So it develops into a momentum when you start talking to different individuals, especially cross-functional issues. And I think that's what ultimately converts into an idea for ready for experimentation. And then we said that let's experiment that idea. So how do you de-risk by prototyping in, like I talked about snacks. We had only prototyped in Bombay City. You can prototype it now with all the e-commerce emergence and modern trade. You can prototype in Amazon or you can prototype in one of the DMART chains just to see what is the consumer reaction. Because as I said, there is no shortcut to getting a consumer reaction. You have to offer the product and not only the product, but the product, the packaging, the brand name, everything else has to appeal to the consumer. And then it has to result in repeat sales. So we we can do all that if we have a culture which is open, which is trusting, and which is basically devoid of bureaucracy. Um, and basically people talk to each other. And support that by initiatives of experimentation, removing fear of failure. If somebody fails, takes if there's an intelligent failure, and if I punish that person in terms of the increment level or, or promotion not happening to the person, you are sending a very strong signal in the organization that you are punishing failure. We don't want to do that. It's okay. We have to celebrate failures. You know, we have to learn from those failures. So, Basically, removing the fear of failure, de-risking by prototyping it, experimentation, and then identifying action standards of prototype and then scaling up. Because launching a consumer product, especially in those days, was very expensive. We needed mass advertising in, in, uh, in television, press, which would require budgets of 20, 25 crores if you wanted to launch in all over India. Now it's changed because of the emergence of D2C brand, you can launch a brand through e-commerce, you can do digital marketing. So the rules of the game have changed, but at that time it was very expensive. So we had to we had to encourage this, this kind of a route. And then what is the role of top management? You know, I, if there is a presentation being made to me by a brand manager, they would know that I'm going to ask the question, what is the innovation you thought about in the brand? It could be an packaging innovation, it could be an advertising innovation, it need not be a completely different product. But uh, basically, top management expectations drive behavior down the line. So it is very important for the top to go on talking about innovation whenever there is an option to talk or demanding innovation when there are reviews happening. And then again, we reinforce that by having innovation awards which are done internally. So every year we invite innovative ideas. We get on average about 15, 20, which are done within the organization and mostly they're done by teams. And then internal jury evaluates that. And more importantly, after evaluation and we've identified the winners, they share their journey. What made innovation happen? What was the innovation? But more importantly, how did the innovation happen? So again, it's shared at all our location, at, at all the levels, including workmen. And I think that is like another way of reinforcing innovation. So combine the cultural part with, with the top management behavior and awards, and then you create an innovative culture. You know? So I think that's what we've tried to do. And I'll just give you an example of innovation, not in, because normally there is a tendency to associate innovation with new products. Of course, new products are very important. I'm not denying that, but there are opportunities of innovation outside the product initiative. So in the year 19, I think 93 or 94, we wanted to establish a new factory and uh, for coconut oil. And we did uh, some sort of theoretical study. We realized that uh, the best location in terms of factory location, in terms of our cost structure, freight cost, tax, uh, purchase tax was the state of Kerala. Now, Kerala at that time, and still I think its perception was it's a very bad taste in a state in terms of industry relations. So all my friends, my family, they said, don't establish a factory in Kerala because on paper, it's showing that you have the best of, shall I say, cost structure. But when you actually get into a factory, you will have huge labor problems and, you know, it will just remain on paper. Now, my HR head at that time and my operations head, they, they took it up as a challenge. They said, no, give us an opportunity 
we'll go to kerala we'll find out and come back to you and we will not give up just because others are saying good we'll try some sort of an innovation we'll come back with an innovative plan to set up a factory in kerala so they went came back and they i think the key thing they they identified was that in a factory in rural areas when people work during the day after work there is nothing else for them to do there is a lot of fatigue in work because they're doing the same repetitive job and after hours there is enough time which leads to union activities so they came with a proposal saying that we will go with kerala but we will try and remove the drudgery of work during working hours as well as after working hours so it was a risk we had put in it was a big factory it was one of our first factories for maricom and i studied that and i said okay let's do it you know because if we are successful it will be a huge financial benefit for us so they identified the whatever land location then while recruiting workers we sent teams to individuals workmen's uh, homes talk to their parents because parents also play an important role in 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 the life these are young guys about 20 25 year old age so and then we said okay we recruited now now that you joined we will have a perpetual job rotation program where you will do the same job for 3 months and after 3 months you will change because then we will remove that drudgery in the job and then we said that after office hours leave it to us we will keep you occupied in in ways which will you enjoy life you know so we had lots and lots of games hobbies music uh, you name it i mean there are programs for them after after their work hours and we divided the whole factory into four houses like you do it in school and then internal competition between them in all these areas of games art culture and i think that really set the right way forward in terms of the motivation we had i mean that factory we didn't have any labor problem and we got many awards from the state government but that risk we took because of the innovative approach paid us hugely in terms of saving money in terms of transportation costs uh, taxation and things like that so i'm saying that you know, innovation has can be included in any part of your organization journey and need not be new products and there has to be thinking innovation of course there is some risk taking in it i took a risk in terms of going ahead with that uh, the factory decision it could have failed but i think that's something which it's okay to fail uh, and i failed multiple times so i would say that i think that's how we have created a new culture it's uh, it's a challenge to maintain that culture because you know new people come in some old people leave so you have to you have to have reinforced on a perpetual basis so when a new person comes in that person has to experience that this is an innovative organization this is a very empowering organization this is a trusting organization this is an organization which which will tolerate failures will not be punished for failure and and basically encourage it is taking so i think that's how we have been able to create an innovative organization and i think that's reflected in our growth rates we have done well in terms of the time we started i started with virtually a zero base uh, in the year <laughs> around 75 and then this year hopefully we'll do about 9 and a half or 10 thousand crores turnover and uh, it's it's worked out well you know in terms of we went public in the ni- year 1996 and from the time where we went public to today our compounded average growth rate in terms of market cap is in the 23 or 25 percent per annum so all in all it's been a great journey uh, and i think i what i wanted to end was i captured my journey in the form of a book which uh, i think kuna uh, made mention earlier and this is this is a book uh, it's a book which was released on 30th of july and the name of the book is harsh realities it's a book which is written by me but uh, valued by professor ramcharan who is a management guru he's written uh, 30 books and they've sold something like 4 million copies and i must say the feedback about the book is amazing i am getting superb feedback it's already a best seller uh, and uh, very good reviews i have given the books to to professionals entrepreneurs students and one thing i can bet after getting all the reviews that there is some take home value for every individual if you read the book because professor ramcharan has converted my journey into into take home values which is a lot of value addition so all i can say is i mean you will not i am ready to bet that if anybody is disappointed i am willing to pay you back some money for the book you bought 
it's I'm that confident because I got hundreds of reviews. Already the reviews are there on Amazon. I got something 170 reviews. I've got a rating of 4.6 on a five-point scale in terms of. So all in all, it's uh, it's good. Uh, my objective of writing the book is not financially. Actually, financially is a big drain on me, but uh, is to actually disseminate the knowledge. So there is some impact I'm able to create to others' lives. You know, and it, there is learning, a lot of learning for for students also in in this. So. I think let me end by saying that it's it's been a great journey, uh, and I was happy that the book has turned out well. Uh, the, the cover, the name of the book, and it's a very easy to read book in a story format, and one can finish. People have said that I finished reading in one one sitting, but it can be read anywhere, and you know all the learnings are captured in a concise way at the end of each chapter in half a page or one page. So I think with that, I I would want to start maybe. In, or open out there is 15 minutes or so. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Harsh Mariwala. It was, as usual, every time, a pleasure hearing you. In fact, we kind of lost track of time in that. <laughs> uh, so I'll just quickly summarize as to what our key learnings were. Uh, we started with this whole idea of right to win, which uh, depended on two... Uh, things. One is innovation. The other is branding. In fact, uh, this was at the organization level. I think for students now, it's not only organizational branding and innovation, but it is also at the personal level. I think that is a learning that I would like to uh, you know, emphasize on. Uh, then, of course, we discussed your innovative journey, if, if I can say. And uh, this has always been uh, really enthralling you know hearing all those uh, small innovations like innovation when we hear it, it seems like a very heavy word which has to have a big lab with all expertise and all that but innovation can be in you know simple common sense things right where you have practical insights so that is i think one of another key learning that we got from your talk and the examples that you had shared the third thing was uh, about the culture of innovation. And I think an important key word is uh, the removal of failure uh, from the minds of people. And that is not only at the top, but uh, throughout the every echelons of the organization where this has to be spread, where you convert culture into values. You talk about commitment which again has to be with every organized, uh, like every person as part of the organization. Uh, an important way to inculcate is through openness. That was again, uh, you know, these are again very simple things when we talk about it, but when taken together, they really have an impact. And of course you are, you and Mariko itself is a living example of that. Finally, you know, when you talk about the book, in fact, uh, I've been reading your book, uh, to be honest, I didn't complete it yet. Uh, but, and I started on a Kindle, but when you showed me the cover, I'm going to, I'm planning to buy uh, the, because the cover itself is so beautiful. So I'll buy it, definitely a hard copy. Uh, but uh, one important thing with this book is, and in fact, this is something I was saying, is that it is very important to document, you know, the experiences that, uh, Indian businesses are having. This is not only a key learning lesson for uh, students, but uh, generally, like in terms of societally, it will have a huge impact. So I think this is something probably uh, each and every entrepreneur and business leaders need to think about. So with that, uh, I will just move on to the questions. Uh, in fact, we have quite a few. Uh, Okay, uh, so the first question is uh, with respect to, so one student has asked, uh, he wants some key lessons, like one or two lessons from you. If you just go back to the like 20, 20 plus self of yourself, and you know, what would you like to advise the students now who's at that age bracket? So I think there's one, uh, what I've written in the book, and these are... Uh my eight maxims, you know, these are lessons for individuals and it could be relevant for students, but I, I mean, if I go into detail, it'll take a long time, but very quickly, I think each person is born with a certain God-given gift. You need to identify, many of us don't know what is our God-given gift. So identify God-given gifts and work on them and, you know, leverage your career based on your gifts rather than trying to 
work too much on your weakness you know that's one number two be focused try to do a few things but do them well rather than trying to be too many through too many things number three is take risks i've talked enough about it number four is evolve your vision you know you can't say day one i will this is my vision it will get evolved depending on the environment depending on how your career shapes up then aim for win win negotiations where you know you can't say win lose kind of thing in life you'll have to negotiate yourself and every few years you need to reinvent yourself in doing something different you know and give up something what you were doing earlier finally you have a purpose in life you have to i mean at some stage in life you'll say what are you born for you know it's just not making money or just not succeeding but there is a certain purpose in life in terms of giving something back to the society uh and then last thing i've talked about is grit you know they say passion is important but passion has to be combined with perseverance and determination and that's what grit is because if you don't have perseverance and determination then you will give up the passion because you don't have that you know so that's the word grit so these are the eight maxims i've gone into detail in the book but i'm just capturing them <laughs> Uh, i think you know passion is the most important thing other thing if you have that i think the others can probably you know fall in line uh, now just a, a related question is so while uh, when you were speaking you said you know uh, like basically an ex- whatever happens in life either it leads to success or it leads to learning right yeah. but so if you have to look back and would would is there anything that you would want to change any uh, opportunity that you would have looked at or done differently nothing major uh, but made some silly mistakes you know and uh, i should not have done that it is uh, and especially these have been done based on very high degree of trust you know when we twice you know when we acquired a company in vietnam and you know there was a promoter who Who, uh, who had a stake and continued for two, three years. When that person exited, you know there was a payout for him. So we should have taken care of that. Okay, you should not load the products in the marketplace and things like that. So it was a little bit of negligence on our side, which resulted in huge payout, much more than uh, what it should have been if we had taken the proper, shall I say, uh, guardrails in terms of uh, you know before he exited. and the same thing happened with another person who same it is basically somebody for somebody who might given some sort of a stake in the organization to turn around the business but we didn't put the guard base so it's mainly these two areas which uh, and then some other silly mistakes i made in terms of uh, expanding too fast in the area of kaya where you know there was a lot of pressure from the investors when you expand fast and we took in trying to expand fast we we took shortcuts in terms of location of the place and you know the service levels got impacted we were not that strong in terms of our own systems processes to to deal with customer service so things like that uh, i regret but otherwise many other mistakes i have failed but i have learned from them also so uh, i think this was one key learning in your talk that i had personally is that you know being uh, where you are today but you still remember your mistakes and you don't shy away in sharing from them so uh, i think that's a great yeah, lesson like, all these mistakes most of the mistakes are are captured in the book you know so and what more importantly what is the learning out of the mistakes yes yes and how it helped me later in life you know in, including uh, going expanding internationally we bought a company in us in a in a ayurvedic and uh, but catering to spas is b2b business and we we were not able to manage that and then again learn from them and how we expanded to other countries another lesson is there in the book so uh, related to your you know expansion strategies abroad there's one yeah. question uh, which is about you know so you had talked about bangladesh and you know yeah, yeah. Uh, so uh, like of course these markets are one where we see a high growth rate in fact uh, yes. once it was india and uh, china and now we are moving more to the developing countries so yeah. how what more opportunities and at the same time challenges do you see when you expand uh, you know to these emerging markets see i think international markets is far difficult to succeed in in markets because each country has its own set of challenges we went to egypt we acquired two friends and then we saw the egyptian revolution which really put us back we started bangladesh we've been there for last maybe 20 years now and we went to bangladesh much much before other indian companies went there and we took that risk because we said okay we should go to a place where others are fearing to go we will take the risk we went there and that has really played a huge role but i think the whole uh, geopolitical situation and you know it's very very different so each 
market is different in terms of distribution infrastructure consumer habits including uh, how the culture of the country how uh, people talent manages there is some in some cases people are just not opening up in vietnam there is always that yes culture and all that so i think you, it's very very complex to grow internationally compared to india and uh, we are currently present not in all the country but our bigger presence is in bangladesh vietnam uh, middle east egypt and south africa and other places we are exporting but the key thing is what is your right to win you need to be clear and our right to win was in in, in neighboring countries because of coconut oil but other countries we have made acquisitions and and present there in vietnam in egypt in south africa our growth has uh, been through acquisitions so so actually my research also relates to mergers and cross border mergers and acquisitions and oh. in fact one of the key things that we always find is the cultural integration issues yeah yeah and so you think and i am also yes. on board and most in most people who gone internationally their overall they gone through the use learning curve and right. the returns on that investments have been much much lower than what they've been able to do so in india so coming back to india where of course you have been hugely successful um even internationally i mean, <laughs> i didn't so uh, from that fmcg perspective say you know getting into rural area so you were talking about you know uh, customer insights or the customization that you need to do based on location and customer variation uh, so what next basically do we you know So do you see in terms of the strategy for growth in this business in the domestic economy so i think the environment is changing and i covered the part, part of need to see brands you know so i think one good great opportunity we are seeing is need to see brand out of acquisition as well as our own brand we have quite two brands beardo which is for the beard uh, products for the beard and it's under core brand today we acquired about 2 3 years back we acquired just hub which is now with the personal care products we also have our own d2c brands so that's one newer opportunity we are seeing and you know, we have to be participating in that there is a lot of disruption in, because of digital uh, journey whether it's e-commerce or whether whatever part of digital so that's another challenge the third is premium addition we are looking at offering products at a premium kind of range and i think a lot of it has to do with consumer insighting and looking at the disruption from the angle of opportunity is not threats if you don't look at it from the if you look at it from a threat opportunity then you know you try and protect yourself but if you look at it from positive angle then you invest in them and i think the key thing is you need to have the right talent to manage the disruption you know i in need to see brand we it's it's a different look location our office also we can't have the fmc mindset to manage need to see brand so it's a different location different teams different profile of individuals managing mostly very very young so the digital journey we strongly believe that it has to be owned by by very young talent you know uh, because they are far more digital savvy than at least me and you so we have to we have to give an opportunity to them and then remove them remove the escape button and you don't tie it up with your existing business which is looked at from a different lens and then you have to go on identifying these trends at consumer level because many of the trends start abroad and then it's a matter of time they come your trends like sustainability natural movement towards natural organic vegan these trends have started few years back but it's a matter of time they become global trends you know and we have to study them in advance so that when it's about to come to india you are able to leverage them right and in fact you talked about it uh, your during your talk when you talked about innovation and how quickly in a digital world the first mover advantage can go away which requires yeah. that complacency is something that we cannot yeah. afford uh, so the last question and then we stop uh, is more to do with your you know uh, the whole family management versus uh, professional management uh, that you were referring so both of ha- this has some advantage and disadvantage right what would be your last comment on that so i was very clear i, I think a lot depends on the kind of business one is you know there are certain businesses which involve high degree of risk taking very agile the risk taking you don't take a risk with some professional because you don't know a uh, question of trust the question of capability and family as that ownership kind of mindset so i think if businesses are require agility risk taking like a say for a foreign exchange business or a, something to invest in a capital markets then it may be better to to be a more of family managed but the kind of business 
I was trying to lead was a profession was an FMCG business where I had to compete with the likes of Lever, the Procter and Gamble, which needed creating a distribution network, which needed branding. And I was very clear from day one that it will have to be a professionally managed organization. So depending on the kind of business you are, you need to identify what works for you. And there is no right answer. Uh, in a family, you've seen it many times. The family itself highly successful. Many times the family is not taken care of. It is detrimental and then leads to fights. So a lot will depend on the kind of business you are in as well as who is there in the family member and can they work together. Sure. Thank you so much, Mr. Mariol. I think I can go on the whole day asking you questions and listening to your insights. But uh, as we have a hard timeline here, and I have already taken two minutes more, uh, I will now, uh, so our uh, director, Professor Manoj Kumari has joined us. So yes. I would uh, uh, hand over the dais to him. Thank you very much once again for this thank, interesting thank, talk. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, what I can say, sir, first of all, I greet you, sir, and extend my heartfelt uh, welcome to our platform meeting. And, sir, uh, you don't require any introduction because your products uh, like parachute uh, and a uh, few more edible oils, you know, they have already made a big difference in the world. And you are the one, sir, who is bringing a lot of foreign uh, uh, exchange and bring, uh, what it, uh, rebuilding the India brand abroad and we all are deeply indebted to you for your great service to the industry as well as nation sir and it is uh, as you know very well sir we are an institute of uh, um, uh, industrial engineering and management basically we are expanding our base in the uh, operational supply chain fintech marketing and other areas and uh, we need blessing from uh, 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 top corporate people like you to grow in our domain, especially to get some uh, act and recognition which are due to us by the government of India. And I'm sure that sir, we will be able to sail it with uh, support and blessing from uh, stalwarts like you. And uh, sir, we can say that recently we have started one center on uh, a center of excellence on logistics and supply chain management where we need more uh, experts and uh, those who have established such a powerful business uh, houses in India like you. So your guidance and support, we also need to train our students as well as many thousands of the professionals who want to reduce the cost of logistics for this country from 16% to somehow compatible to 8 to 9%. Yeah. So I can say that you are one leading light and uh, we all are in nitty, right from faculty, staff and students. We are really so deeply indebted to you for coming and hope to get your blessing in days to come in many ways. And with this note, sir, once again, on, on behalf of everybody in nitty, sir, we wish you all the best in your endeavor to further take the journey of all your FMCG products and the products to the rest part of the world and become one of the well-known giants in the field of uh, uh, MCG and others. Thank you, sir. For thank you, Professor Tiwari. Thank you. And thank you very much for calling me to your uh, uh, prerna. And uh, it's always a pleasure to uh, to be with all of you. And I think we also recruit from NITI. So we also get uh, students from there. So we very happy our HR is. When I normally I get a lot of requests for for participating in such talks. And first thing I check with our HR is, should I do that? So, yeah, you should always do it for NITI. It's an important mm -hmm. institution. So we're running a great institution. Congratulations. But separately, I think I've been in dialogue about my book. You know, you were just saying, Punam, that, you know, it should get... Uh, yeah. uh, so it is, I think, uh, three institutes I've been in dialogue with them. They want to write case studies on this book. So one is ISB, another is uh, SP Jain School of Management. Third is, uh, is uh, IAM Bangalore. So we are currently in um, talking to them in terms of writing research studies, to case studies for the book. So hopefully, sir, we also, sir, we will also do for you, sir. No matter, sir, we will also do branding and uh, write a case study on your products and your uh, yeah. right yeah. and going ahead in the business scenario, sir. We will certainly contact you, sir, very soon, sir. And the yeah. bright minds which are here, they will be our strength, sir. Uh, that thank, you, thank you, thank you, and all the best. So can I withdraw? Yeah, thank you, sir. Thank, thank you very you, much. Thank you for ending in time. Superb. Thank uh, you. Sir. sir, if we can have two minutes of yours, yes, then we'll just do the vote of thanks. Thank you, sir.
thank you sir for your kind words so on behalf of the entire niti fraternity i would like to thank mr harsh mariwala sir for sparing his valuable time to address our students and faculty we hope that you continue to be engaged with niti and give us a chance to host you again in person sometime i would also like to thank our director dr manoj kumar tiwari sir and dean student affairs dr hemalathe ma'am for their continuous efforts to facilitate an excellent learning environment for niti students i thank all the faculties and students who attended the session asked their questions and made it more fruitful for everyone this event was coordinated by prerna management group a student committee of niti thank you sir again for having delivered such a motivating and insightful speech i request the organizing uh, committee prerna management group and participating faculty members to kindly switch on their camera for a virtual photograph with the guest of honor with your permission sir yes sure is done sir thanks a lot again thank you thank you very much sir are we done thank you very much thank you okay.